Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, welcome to Spark Summer 2016. We're super excited to have you here. Uh, so this event is actually our largest Spark Summit yet. It, uh, it has sold out this morning at 2,500 attendees. And uh, we have a really great program lined up for you, not just the keynotes, but also uh, some, some really awesome technical uh, talks in five tracks uh, uh, later in the next uh, couple of days. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to talk about Apache Spark 2.0, which is the next uh, major release of the open source project. And it's really something that the community has been putting together for a long time. Uh, basically, uh, ever since we started, uh, ever since we got 1.0, we've been looking at ways to improve um, Apache Spark. And these are all coming together in this next release. So um, what is uh, Apache Spark 2.0? So it's, it's uh, actually it's the next major release. It's going to come out uh, later this month. And in fact, if you want to try out uh, some of the new features, there's an unstable preview release already posted on the Apache Spark website. Uh, so you can download that and check that out. This is not uh, sort of a real release in that it's not guaranteed to be, you know, to, to be stable and to be API uh, compatible with like, what will actually become 2.0, but it's a good way uh, to try things out. Um, even though this is a, a major release, uh, you know, major version number, uh, it remains highly compatible with Apache Spark 1.x. And so we hope that it's easy for people to migrate onto. There are only some very small changes in some cases uh, to, to basically fix issues with dependencies. Um, and that's, that's something that we take very seriously in the project. We took it seriously from the beginning because uh, it's extremely important to, you know, to be able to keep up with a project and not have to uh, to migrate your code um, uh, all the time in order to actually benefit from the latest bug fixes. So as a developer, like that was always kind of the more frustrating thing to me when, when things I depended on had that problem. Um, so hopefully it's, it's easy to, to try out and you know, you'll, get, uh, you'll, you'll get many, um, uh, many opportunities to, to do that incrementally. Um, and finally, uh, Spark 2.0 is our largest uh, um, open source um, release yet. We have over 2,000 patches already uh, from more than 280 contributors. So uh, I'd like to, to thank everyone who has contributed to this release. Um, so, OK, cool. So, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about what's going on, I'm obviously not going to be able to cover everything in, uh, in this short keynote. Um, but basically, um, a lot of the, the work in 2.0 just goes back to the philosophy we have for the whole project. And this is based around three key ideas. So first of all, Spark offers a, a unified uh, programming model and engine uh, that supports many different types of applications, anywhere from batch jobs to streaming or interactive. And the idea here is that we want to let users build end-to-end -end applications. We don't want them to have to hook together a whole bunch of systems and reason about how those systems interact. And this has been very um, uh, useful in the sense that most of the users we see uh, actually combine many of these different processing modes. Um, so that's one of the themes. The second theme is high-level APIs. We want a system that is easy to use, and having high-level APIs also enables rich optimizations, which is something that we've been taking uh, increasing advantage of uh, lately uh, in, in the project. And finally, we designed Spark to integrate broadly with many other systems. It's agnostic to the storage system, so you can run it on data that you have anywhere, which is very useful because in reality, data is spread out uh, in many locations and is, is expensive to move. Um, it integrates with many uh, libraries. I'll talk a little bit about integrating, for example, with, with new uh, machine learning libraries and things like that. It runs on many different cluster managers and so on. So all these themes remain in, uh, in the next release, and a lot of the new features try to strengthen these themes. Uh, so I just have a list of so some of the major updates in 2.0. There's, there's obviously uh, uh, you know, about 2,000 more, <laughs> more features that uh, I didn't get to list on here. But, um, but um, uh, I just wanted to, to, to explain some of them. Uh, and then later in the conference, we'll have talks about many more of them. Um, so probably the two biggest things that are happening, and one of the reasons we went um, for the version number 2.0, is um, these, uh, these improvements to the structured APIs in Apache Spark. 
the structured APIs are a new set of APIs that came out in the last two years, starting with uh, data frames and then data sets, uh, that uh, give the engine more information about your data and let it do much richer optimizations. I'll talk a little bit about that. But in this release, we have both a whole bunch of performance optimizations for them and a little bit of uh, unification of these APIs. For example, this new entry point Spark session that makes it easier to use all of them uh, and just easier in integration between data frame and data set. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is structured streaming. This is still uh, kind of early on and experimental, but it's a uh, high-level streaming API built on the structured engine, and it can do some very cool things that uh, you don't get in, um, in other streaming systems today. Um, and uh, you know, it, builds, it, it integrates very well with all these, these things. Um, on the machine learning side, one, one exciting feature is model exports, so being able to export uh, models or pipelines and then use them in, uh, you know, load them in another program and, and serve them in production. Uh, and the R bindings and, uh, of, of Apache Spark have also been greatly improved. Um, and finally, we have some, some cool uh, new language support. So all of SQL 2003 um, is, is now supported, uh, which is really exciting for you know, people connecting sort of SQL applications. Uh, Scala 2 12 as well has been added in, in this release. Uh, but these, these changes happening in 2.0 are just kind of a small part in some way of the Spark community. Uh, there's also a lot of great action happening in, in, in the broader community uh, that you'll hear about at the conference. And I just wanted to highlight some things that appear in the talks to, uh, today. So deep learning libraries are a thing that there's been a, a ton of attention towards from throughout the community. And uh, there are at least um, kind of four efforts that, that I know of um, that are integrating you know, existing deep learning learning um, systems with Apache Spark. And there'll be talks from um, um, uh, Baidu, Yahoo, um, and UC Berkeley, and Databricks. There was actually a meetup last night which looked at a lot of these libraries. I think you can find a recording of that pretty soon. Um, graph Frames is a new API for graph queries that you'll talk about. There are multiple talks about PyData, the Python data ecosystem. Um, and uh, there are also talks about reactive streams and, uh, and uh, ACA. Um, and finally, there are some really cool language bindings coming out in, in C Sharp and JavaScript. So uh, these are just some of the things you'll be able to see in the conference. I encourage you to check them out. Um, the really nice thing about all these is you know, all this work kind of uh, ties together and interoperates together because it builds on this common uh, low-level interface with, within Spark, which is RDDs and data frames. So that's one of the real strengths of the project, that you can combine these libraries and these optimizations, even when completely different people have, um, have built them. So in, in my talk, I'm, I'm just going to dive a little into two of the things, the ones here, the structured ones, uh, and then you'll get to see many of these later in the conference. So just to explain the structured APIs, I think you know, may, many people may have uh, seen them in the past couple of years, but, but they are kind of new uh, to Apache Spark. Uh, these are some APIs that, uh, again, are designed to give Spark more information about your computation and your data so it can do more optimizations. And the first one that came out uh, is the data frame API. So this is modeled after R data frames and pandas. And basically, um, this uh, you know, runs on the same engine as Spark SQL. Um, it lets you access data from a variety of data sources. In this little snippet, we're just reading some JSON, and it automatically figures out a schema for the JSON data. Um, and then it lets you do these um, database-like operations or pass in custom code. So here, um, we're taking some, some events from a JSON log file, and we're joining it with a table of users. Maybe this is sitting in a database like MySQL. Um, and then we group stuff by location and, and status um, of the log message. Um, and we figure out the average you know, duration of those, uh, of those visits or something like that. Um, and then maybe we filter out, OK, only the ones where the status was, a, was an error. So this is kind of the API, pretty, you know, pretty simple kind of high-level operations. But the really cool thing about these structured APIs is that um, the engine then optimizes them in a very similar way to, to how a database, for example, would optimize uh, a query plan. So in a case like this, for example, we get a, an optimized query plan where we can do stuff like push this filter for error above the join because we'll never read the messages that don't have errors and so on. This is a thing that is much harder to do for the, um, for the RDD API where you just get Java functions. Um, and um, um, on top of that, uh, using things in this API, we also get very efficient execution. So Spark actually generates 
code at runtime that combines all these operators and uh, is kind of the same thing as if you'd written the whole program you know, um, in, in a single block. But of course, you don't have to do that. You can have a modular program made out of many different um, operators. Um, and the data set API, which I haven't shown here, is a similar thing, but with static typing. So these are, these are kind of the structured APIs. They've, they've been one of the areas with the most attention in Spark. Um, in um, in 2.0, we have some really cool improvements to these. Uh, so first of all, we have um, uh, optimizations, whole stage code generation, which can actually optimize across multiple operators, like I showed before, and can give pretty high speed ups close to a factor of 10, depending on, on your query, and also much faster input and output from Apache Parquet and from the built-in cache. So these are two of the things in there, and they uh, immediately apply to any programs you have using these APIs. Um, and then the second thing we have in 2.0, which is pretty exciting, is structured streaming. This is a higher level API for streaming that's also built on data frames and this engine. And it includes a lot of higher level features like working with event time, timestamps external to your data, windowing sessions, and support for many uh, sources and syncs. Uh, but the thing that really sets it apart from other streaming engines is that it also supports interactive and batch queries on the same data in a, in a consistent fashion. Um, and this is because this is actually the most common use case you've seen of streaming. Nobody really comes in and just says, oh, I have a stream of data, and I want to run a map function over it, and that's it. In reality, you have a stream of data, and you want to compute some result um, and maybe serve it to an application, uh, or maybe you want to train some model in a batch job and then update it in a streaming job, and so on. So structured streaming is designed to enable that. It can do things like. Um, aggregate stuff in a stream and just create a table and serve it using JDBC. Uh, it can do stuff like change the queries at runtime or build and apply machine learning models. This is what we're designing the API for. And uh, the name we have for this is, is not just streaming, but it's kind of end-to-end -end continuous application. So you should be able to do both the serving part and the computing part of your streaming application in, um, in one piece. Um, so that's, that's structured streaming. Um, the, um, the other thing that's really cool and, and unique about structured streaming is the way we're setting up the API. And again, this is, you know, the, the whole thing is still early on, but I encourage you to, to try, try out the version in 2.0. Um, so to do the API, we, we looked and we thought a lot of streaming APIs are actually very complex. You need to think about corner cases, failures, late data, all this kind of stuff. And instead, we decided to have the same API basically as batch processing. So in Spark 1.x, we had this notion of data frames, which are essentially a finite table of data. And you can do different operations on it, like group by and, and average and so on. Um, in 2.x, we just have essentially infinite data frames. So imagine you had a table with all the data from the beginning of your program. What do you want to compute on it? You want to compute an average? You want to group by hour? Whatever it is, just tell us in the same API you use for data frames. And then when you have an infinite one, the engine will turn it into an incremental execution plan. So you just describe the same thing you would have wanted in a batch job, and we run it incrementally as new data arrives. Um, and this is how, um, you know, this is kind of how the API works. Um, so as a super simple example, um, there's a batch job here that uh, basically uh, loads data from Amazon S3 and then writes it into MySQL. So this is just, a, you could write this today um, in, in Spark data frame. So we read some JSON data from S3. We do a group by user ID an hour to find the average latency. Um, and then we write it to MySQL. So this is a you know, pretty reasonable kind of batch job. Uh, to turn that into a continuous job with structured streaming, you just have to change two of the operators here. So instead of opening the bucket once, you tell it you want to read a stream. Um, and then as new data arrives, the job will automatically update the result in MySQL. And then here at the bottom, instead of saying, you know, write the data once, you say start stream. Uh, so this is pretty cool because you don't need to worry too much about like, things like late data and so on. You just tell it, keep the MySQL table in sync with this result, and the engine will handle that for you. 
So you can find out a lot more about these things in the conference. I'm not going to have uh, the time to cover all of them, but I'm, gonna, I'm highlighting these talks up here. So there are talks on structured APIs, structured streaming, a lot of the machine learning things, and multiple talks on the uh, broader community projects I mentioned. And I definitely encourage you to try um, the, um, the, the preview uh, package um, as well. Um, so hopefully you'll learn a lot of, more about them in the next couple of days. So the next, the, the, the kind of final thing I wanted to talk about is, um, is growing the Apache Spark community. And here I'm, I'm really excited to mention two uh, new initiatives from Databricks that are designed you know, to, to help everyone uh, better use Apache Spark. So basically what we've seen everywhere is that the largest challenge in um, applying big data is the skills gap. Even if you have really high level APIs like data frames or MLlib, figuring out the best way to use them, you know, the exchanging best practices, figuring out how to deploy them, really mastering this uh, is difficult. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always helpful to have more resources on it. Um, actually, one really cool thing that came out this year was the uh, Stack Overflow Developer Survey. So Apache Spark actually topped the uh, top paying tech in the US for, um, you know, for, uh, for, for developers. Um, so you can look at this and uh, you know, talk to your manager if, uh, if, if this is not in line with what you're seeing. Uh, sorry for the managers in the room. Um, and uh, Scala was also second. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff up there. Um, but, uh, so, so this is great to see you know, for the developers, but obviously Obviously, we'd love to, to have more people uh, learn and, and be able to use this stuff. Um, so we're really excited to, to announce today um, a GA of Databricks Community Edition. Uh, this is a free version of the Databricks uh, cloud service that's set up for learning Apache Spark. So it has not just um, text materials, but interactive tutorials you can run on real data sets to learn Apache Spark. Um, it includes Apache Spark, you know, the same code you will get from, um, you know, from Apache, as well as popular uh, data science uh, tools and libraries like Scikit-Learn. And it also includes very powerful visualization and debugging tools to understand how your Spark application is running and be able to figure out you know, how, to, how to best optimize it and how to run it. Um, so we actually put out a beta of this um, in February, and it's generally available. You just need an email account to sign up. And um, uh, there's a lot of great content on there already. Um, and uh, the second thing I want to mention is um, uh, um, online courses. So we're running five MOOCs, massive open online courses, on Apache Spark together with UC Berkeley um, and UCLA and edX. Um, and these are going to start in just a, a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, again, all of, all of these courses are free. And um, you can actually run all the exercises for these in Databricks Community Edition as well, as well as, of course, any Spark cluster. Um, so that's, you know, that's the things we wanted to say. We hope you take advantage of these. And uh, to demonstrate uh, Databricks Community Edition, as well as some of the new features in 2.0, um, I'd like to invite Michael Armburst. Michael Armburst is a Spark PMC member. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's also one of the, the earliest um, uh, team members at Databricks. Uh, and he actually designed and, and created the first version of Spark SQL, as well as a lot of the other APIs that you'll see today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matei. I am super excited to be here today to demonstrate exactly how you can use Apache Spark 2.0 inside of my favorite platform, Databricks Community Edition, which, as Matei just announced, is now available to everyone in the world for free. So head over to databricks.com and sign up. And after you've done that, you can go to the login screen to get into your personal workspace. So I'm going to start by logging in. And once it rehydrates my workspace, there we are. Uh, I'm in my own personal copy of Databricks. And what you'll see here is this is a cloud-based platform for running Apache Spark and doing big data analysis. It's got a whole bunch of tools, including interactive notebooks and automatic cluster management. Uh, and pretty much our goal when we were creating this platform was to make big data analytics tasks where simple things should be simple and complex things should be possible. So, uh, all of this automatic management actually makes a lot of the, the kind of complexity of running and dealing with fault tolerance a lot easier. But as Matei said, there's still this problem of the skills gap. Learning Spark, learning statistics can still be pretty difficult. And in this case, we didn't forget Spark's academic roots. 
we actually have a whole bunch of content built into the platform designed specifically to help you learn both statistics and Apache Spark. So if we click on training inside of the workspace, you'll see there's lectures from award-winning professors at UC Berkeley and Stanford that cover the basics of big data and data science. And this is no ordinary classroom. There are also interactive workbooks with explanations and code examples that you can actually run here in your browser. Uh, so I'm actually going to take this and say import, and it's actually going to make a copy of this particular lesson, which is written in Python. It's going to copy it into my own personal Databricks workspace. Once I've done that, I can actually you know, read through some of the explanation, and then when it comes time to test my knowledge, I can click on any of the cells and hit Shift Enter. And what you'll see is it automatically attached me to a Spark cluster running in the cloud, computed the answer, and returned it to my browser. I can go in and I can edit the text to test my understanding of Spark. So we'll kind of change that there. Good. It still checks out. Um, so this is pretty, a pretty great way to start learning the basics of Spark and, uh, and uh, of, of data science in general. However, once you're done with the basics, I find the best way to really dive in and fully understand a platform as complex as Apache Spark is to actually take a real world problem and look at how someone solved it. And here's where the featured notebooks come into play. We've taken a whole bunch of content where we've actually done end-to-end -end examples of how to use Apache Spark and built them into the platform. I'm going to start with an analysis that is pretty topical, given what today is, uh, the 2016 election tweets. And so what you'll see is this notebook actually takes data from the Twitter stream, and it graphs over time how, many, how often certain candidates are mentioned. And so they did this with Spark. Uh, they took Spark, they took Spark SQL, they took Spark Streaming, and they combined them together into this, this streaming program that's going to continually update the answer. So, you know, I'm, uh, Matei said we care a lot about APIs, so you can still use all of these Spark 1.0 APIs with Spark 2.0. But I'm actually pretty excited about the stuff that he talked about today. So I'm going to see if we can maybe rewrite this from scratch instead of going with this. So I'm going to go to File and click Clone, and we'll call this 2016 Election Tweets 2.0. So now that we've got this other notebook, I'm going to go ahead and just delete all of this code here. And instead, we're going to just start with Spark. So you'll see it, again, attached me to my Spark 2.0 cluster. And uh, what, what you'll see is we've actually got this thing called the Spark Session. It's your one-stop shop for working with structured data and unstructured data, batch and streaming. This is the SQL context. This is the Spark context. This is the Hive context. This is the streaming context, all in one place. And for those of you who are developers in the audience, you'll be happy to see that you can even see exactly the bits from the official Apache repository that this notebook is based on. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to start by loading the data set. So we'll do Spark read text, and I'll point it at some JSON that I've stored on S3. So we'll do MNT data tweets. And then we'll just go ahead and display some rows from that data set. So it's actually going to go out to S3 and fetch that text data and display what it looks like. So what you'll see here is I've got a whole bunch of JSON. But if I want to actually take this kind of raw, unstructured data, and I want to break it down by time, and I want to create this graph of mentions over time, I'm going to have to do some transformations. So I'm going to take this and copy it, and we'll put it down here. And fortunately, the read interface actually supports a whole bunch of different formats, not just text. So I'm going to, in this case, it looks like JSON. But you can also use the data frame reader to connect to more advanced data sources like MySQL or Cassandra or Redshift, Parquet, uh, JSON, CSV, ORC. And so when I hit this, it's actually going to go and convert this data into a table. And once it's converted into a table, I can now use the data frame APIs to pull out only the information that I care about. Because as you can see, there's quite a bit of information here. So I'll do select. And the things I care about are created at and the text. So we'll go ahead and run that. And it's going to pull out just those two columns from the JSON data. So pretty cool. And this is what you would typically call ETL. So I'm going to use some markdown, which is a nice feature of notebooks, to explain what I'm doing as I go along. So we're going to do some ETL, which is turning unstructured into structured. Should have picked an easier word to spell. <laughs> and to be a little more concrete, I'm going to kind of describe exactly what I want to do to munge the data in this tweets. You can also put images into your markdown. So I'll do slash Im images slash tweet. 
And so you can see, given any tweet, there's kind of two transformations we need to do before we can actually build the graph that we're trying to make. So we need to take the timestamp and we need to bucket it by time. So you know, put it into our buckets. And then we also need to take each tweet and figure out who it's talking about. So in this case, this tweet is actually talking about two candidates. And this is an operation that's not particularly easy to do in SQL. So let's start with the window function. So I'm just going to go here and use the new window function, which we added in Spark 2.0 for streaming. But of course, you can also use it in batch. So I'll do window created at. And I'll say I want to bucket this by one hour intervals. And we'll call this new column window. And so what you'll see is it's actually going to take this first column, which says you know, when the tweet was actually created. And it's going to take the time 3.56 PM. It's going to put it into the 1,500 hour bucket. So now we've kind of grouped all of these into our intervals. So now this, uh, this assigning tweets to candidates is actually a little bit harder. I need to take any single row, and I need to turn it into 0, 1, 2, or 3 rows, which isn't particularly easy to express in SQL, but is very easy to express in a programming language like Scala or Java or Python. So I'm going to show a couple of different APIs here. Here I used data frames. And now I'm going to use data sets. So I will use this function called explode. And I'm going to take the text and turn it in to a candidate. And we'll tell Scala that the text is going to be a string. And I'm going to create a list of candidates that we care about. So we'll say Hill, Burn. We'll use shortened versions of their names, so we'll catch things like Feel the Burn, and Trump. And we only want to output one of the candidates. I'm just going to copy this. Uh, we'll filter that so that it only shows up if the text contains that, that word. And we'll make it to lowercase so that we can actually uh, be a little more tolerant of, of what we're matching. Oh, OK. Can you see it now? Is that good? Maybe uh, I'll go one bigger. Cool. So we've got, we've got all of the data now in the form that we want. You can see that we've taken uh, tweets and we've actually assigned them to individual candidates. And uh, let's see. For example, in this case, this tweet uh, was actually talking about two different candidates. It's talking Donald Trump questioning Hillary, and it's assigned to both Hillary and Trump. So now we can take this and actually turn it in to a table. So you'll see this is actually going to kick off a fairly large Spark job. And this is another kind of case where notebooks actually make learning significantly easier. I can watch interactively what's going on in the cluster. It's taken this data set, it's split it into 200 pieces, and it's running it 100 tasks at a time in parallel. So while that's running, I'm actually going to switch over here to SQL. Move that up so everyone can see. Uh, and I want to do kind of standard SQL aggregation. So I'll do a count star by the candidate and window from this tweets table that we just created. We want to group by the candidate and the window and order by the same. And we'll go ahead and display that. And so you can see it's run that analysis. And here's another pretty cool feature of notebooks. Instead of having to pull out a library, I can interactively graph these results right here in the browser. So I'll take this and turn it into a bar chart. And I'll say, actually, I want to color this by candidate. And it'd be better if this was a stacked bar chart. And we'll go ahead and click that. And what you can see is now we've got our temporal analysis of how different mentions of candidates changes over time. So that's pretty cool, but that's actually only part of it. I actually want to dive into specific topics and see how those change over time. So we'll say where text like. And let's say if I look at emails, which, uh, which candidate do you think they're going to be talking about? <laughs> and so <laughs> Twitter predicts <laughs> Hillary Clinton. And I think something probably happened on this day. Uh, and let's see what else. How about uh, feel the? Oh, and we had some very excited Bernie Sanders and these uh, supporters in these hours. Um, what about great again? 
pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty expected. What about something like small hands? <laughs> and <laughs> exactly as predicted. OK, so at this point, you're probably saying, I was promised streaming, and here he is doing all of this analysis on data from the 22nd of last month. Uh, and unfortunately, I've got bad news for you. If you're expecting me to come on stage and write a bunch of streaming code, I'm not going to do that, because I'm actually just going to take this batch code, and I'm going to copy this cell, and I'm going to paste it down here. And this is the true power of structured streaming and the unified APIs in Spark 2.0. All I have to do is take the exact same code I used in batch and point it instead at the Twitter fire, a replica of the Twitter fire hose, which I set up earlier. And now, when I hit Shift Enter, it's going to detect that there's actually a streaming part of this query plan. And instead of running a single query, it's actually going to run a lot of little queries over and over and over again, incrementally updating the answer as new data arrives. And this is an example of the continuous applications that Matei was talking about. So what you can see is as data streams in, new bars will be showing up, showing exactly how the mentions are going on on Twitter. So that's pretty cool that you can do this with one single API. But if I stopped here, I'd be cheating. Because the hard part of streaming is not always just getting the code working, but it's the operational aspects of taking that code, running in production, dealing with the scale. And this is another case where I think the interactive notebooks really shine. So here you can actually see a chart that's showing how we're processing data. And it's showing a couple of things. This top chart here is showing the rate at which data is arriving and the rate at which we're processing it. And in fact, that orange line is not good. We're falling behind. Data is arriving faster than we can process it. That's pretty embarrassing. But it turns out I'm not worried, because Matei promised me that there were going to be some performance improvements in Spark 2.0. So let's go ahead and turn those on. These are actually turned on by default, but you know, dramatic effect and everything. We'll go ahead and flip those on. And now that I've run this code gen command, what it's actually going to do is when it gets to the next batch, it's going to re-optimize the query plan. And the old query plan that was working with a single tuple at a time, passing it in between operators, has now changed. And instead, we're code genning an entire batch of operators in one thing. And it's, as you can see, significantly faster. <laughs> So what the green is showing you is that we've not only, like, we're not only able to process the data that arrived, but we can actually deal with all of the data that was backing up before. And as a result, the latency has dropped and the stream continues. So OK, that's pretty cool. And it's pretty nice to be able to do these kinds of analysis. Let's, uh, let's go through and review what we did. So starting at the top, we started with a bunch of unstructured text data. I'm just going to go ahead and clean this up while we go. And we took that and we did an ETL to transform that JSON into a structured table. And we did this using data frames and data sets. We then played around with this data set in batch to get our analysis exactly how we wanted. And then we took that same code and we applied it to a stream. And so what you'll see now is all of that code from the previous slide is now replaced by just a couple of lines of data frames, data sets, and SQL using Spark 2.0. So this is great in isolation, but the power of big data is being able to share your findings. And this is the reason that we built collaboration into the core of the Databricks community platform. I may want to take this, and I may want to send it to my boss, or I may want to even you know, post it on the internet. So if I click here and say publish, it's actually going to give me a URL, which is a static version of this notebook marked up with all of the information you need to run it. Other users of Community Edition can actually just click here and take this into their own copy. And, and uh, fr from there, they can remix it and do new things with it. So now comes my favorite part of the demo. Uh, I am actually you know, not a data scientist. I'm a SQL guy. And so I want to see what you guys can do with Databricks Community Edition. So I'm going to take the code for this, and I'm going to go ahead and tweet it. And I am very excited to see what you guys come up with. Thank you very much.